Um, and I think that we need to step back as humans and have a perspective on what we're doing to ourselves. I mean, I get really pissed because I'm seeing so many young, younger people sicker and I think to myself, we have to step back about these modern day chemicals that have only been in our lives over the last 200 years at best, I would argue maybe 150. Well, hello everyone, I'm Dr. David Perlmutter. Welcome again to The Empowering Neurologist. You know, we gotta face the facts. We live in a very toxic world. We are exposed to 90,000 new chemicals that have been introduced uh, into our world in the past 100 years. And in fact, here in America, over a thousand new chemicals are put into production to which we are exposed every single year. And we wanna think that, well, there's great oversight looking at these chemicals, making sure that what's in our cosmetics, what's even in our food and water is safe, but we're about to find out that that isn't really what's going on. And it truly is a bit worrisome. We know that the various chemicals that we are exposed to uh, are associated with changes in our endocrine function, that many of these chemicals mimic uh, endocrine transmitters in our bodies, affecting things like reproduction and even thyroid function. We even see the effects these days of environmental pollutants that we're all exposed to having an effect on our immune function. And certainly in the context of COVID, that's a really important consideration. So we're going to be looking at a book today, which is called Non-Toxic Guide to Living Healthy in a Chemical World. Dr. Ailey Cohen is a board-certified rheumatologist and integrative medicine specialist, as well as an environmental health expert living in Princeton, New Jersey. She has collaborated with the Environmental Working Group, Cancer Schmancer, and other disease prevention organizations, and is co-editor of a wonderful textbook called Integrative Environmental Medicine, which is part of the Oxford Press Weill Integrative Medicine Academic Series. In 2015, she created thesmarthuman.com to share environmental health, disease prevention, and wellness information with the public. She lectures nationally on environmental health topics for elementary schools, high schools, colleges, universities, medical schools, and even physician training programs. And she's a regular expert guest on television, print, and on podcasts as well. She has done a very uh, important TEDx presentation called how to protect your kids from toxic chemicals. And that is available on YouTube. So let's jump right into our interview. Dr. Cohen, thank you for joining us today on the program. Thank you so much for having me. Now we're so formal. People should know that we actually uh, were, were chatting ahead of time. It was less formal. Now it gets all of a sudden so serious. Your book starts off with uh, uh, an experience that you had with your dog. And uh, that uh, proved to be the lemons from which you made this lemonade. but. Tell us what happened with your dog. So um, I was just to give you the setting. I was a new mom. I had uh, a newborn and uh, I think a two and a half year old at the time. And we had already had our, our golden retriever for about four and a half years. He was my firstborn, so to speak. Um, and beautiful, healthy dog. And at around four and a half years of age, um, he became sick. And, you know, golden retrievers, he eats everything, chews everything, pulls everything off everywhere. We thought, oh, you know, he probably just had a sock you know, chewed something and we took him to the vet and um, he was icteric. So he had yellowing of the inside of his ears. And it turns out at that, that moment, we found out that he had what was called um, uh, autoimmune hepatitis. So his immune system was actually attacking him at his liver. And we really didn't understand or know this. We didn't even know dogs could get this kind of diagnosis. We know in humans, of course, um, and I'm an autoimmune disease doctor. So the ironies really run deep in this situation. Um, and we ended up taking care of him for about six months using all the the human immune system suppressing medications. And he, he eventually succumbed to his illness, but it was just an eye-opening and heartbreaking um, entree into the world of environmental health because I was, you know, at the time knew nothing about chemicals, nothing. I was eating Cheese Whiz, Oreos. I mean, I was just really not really into the, the idea that environment affects human health or pet health. And so that was really the entree into understanding that there can be exposures that can turn the immune system, trigger the immune system onto itself. And here you are uh, 
acting as a rheumatologist, dealing with autoimmune conditions in humans, and basically working to treat the smoke, not the fire. I mean, let me characterize it as you were uh, doing your best to calm the immune system down, but had not yet realized that we should, or, or it might be worthwhile to consider what might be compromising the immune system in the first place. So... So that was a real eye opener for you. Yeah, uh, but you, I, it was it was interesting because having had the training in autoimmune disease up until that point, you know, it was kind of putting together this background of information of why am I also seeing so many new autoimmune disease patients? Why are they coming in younger? Um, why are they coming in with less family history that you would expect for a diagnosis of some type of autoimmune disease? So all these kind of training background information kind of was colliding at once. Um, and I think that's why I was particularly intrigued about this particular situation with my dog. As uh, so, as it so often happens, I, I, I will tell you a brief story um, that uh, both of our Wheaton Terriers died of large cancerous tumors. Uh, and we realized that the park where we were taking them for a walk was really quite toxic. Uh, and you know, we, we puzzled over it as well. What is it about a dog? You know, why would they be dying of cancer like this? And it was very challenging. I mean, I, I think back to reading your book that you were actually uh, tapping the ascites fluid. You were drawing fluid out of the abdomen around the liver uh, to keep your dog alive at one point. Yeah, well, my husband and I are both, I mean, I'm obviously a physician, but my husband's a physician also. And, um, you know, there's not enough of a... Um, I would say an establishment around helping animals at this chronic stage, um, similar to humans in many regards. Um, and we we really wanted to make him comfortable and and extend his life out in the most comfortable way, the the way you'd think of your your favorite relative or best friend. So we really just treated him um, conventionally, steroids, um, you know, and um, appropriate pain medicine if he needed it. But essentially the fluid that builds up around a liver that's not moving fluids as it should, right? Blood and fluids, um, you know, gets stagnant, can back up. And that's where you get pressure and ascites and different changes in the vascular system. Um, I mean, it's just plumbing really. And so what we did was, um, you know, the vet who was very, you know, warm with us and, and really was just heartbroken with us, he taught us with the ultrasound, he put an X on the, the belly with, you know, a marker. And at night after we put our babies to sleep, um, you know, we'd go into the kitchen and we'd literally stick a long needle in, sterile needle, and we'd draw off, you know, upwards of a gallon of fluid off of this this animal's, this baby's, uh, you know, belly. And, um, and it would relieve him and he'd be much more comfortable. Um, and we just kind of waited out to see how far we would go with this to, you know, not leave him in any discomfort. So that tragic experience uh, for you, uh, really the bright side is it led you to realize that so many things in the environment, I think it was his play toy that you became suspect of and, and other things, the, the flea and tick stuff that you were putting on the back of his neck that we were all told uh, is a good thing to do. Uh, you know, what is so compelling about the first part of your book is the uh, first, the, the incredible number of chemicals that are in our environment to which we are exposed daily. But beyond that, the virtual complete lack of regulation. So tell us uh, about how you discovered that and what it was like when you finally had that moment where you said, my gosh, there's no regulation of these. Because we all assume when you buy a product, well, I'm sure the uh, some administration has looked at it, made sure that it's safe for me to, to use on, when I shampoo my hair or lotion for my skin or sunscreen. But the reality is that's not happening, is it? No, and I think what was really um, heartbreaking in addition to being making me angry was that I had never learned any of this information in medical school, high school, medical school, college, pre-med classes, residency, even in practice for at that point about 10 years. And, you know, I really, because I had not learned it, similar to integrative medicine and functional medicine thoughts and practices, when you haven't learned it from teachers you respect and in environments that you respect, you sort of don't believe that it exists or it's real or, you know, that there's other tools out there. So when I was, um, un, you know, trying to think about his food and whether or not his food might have been contaminated to make him sick or the flea and tick collar that we would drip on the back of his neck uh, because we were told to, um, 
we live on a farm in New Jersey, and so we have glyphosate sprayed literally outside our next our back door. I mean, this is what I'm also currently battling. Um, you know, and when you think about all those different types of exposures that he he's around, even our children are around. If you think about it, um, you know, it was it called into question. You know, is there something wrong with this? And as I started looking up. Um, you know, whether or not pesticides could cause autoimmune hepatitis or um, plastics and plasticizer or chemicals like the toy that he always had in his mouth. I mean, this was unusual how, how often he kept it in his mouth. Um, you know, it started to peel away these questions. And when I would look around the kitchen, and at that point it was just me and my cat, more or less, I would say, is this true? Is this, is, could this possibly be true? And I would reach out to the people that I knew were in this environment, um, environmental working group. Um, certainly I was getting quite a bit of information from them at the time, even back then. And I started to ask questions and that's, that's when I really reached out to them and said, listen, is this stuff true? And they said, not only is it true, you're one of the first doctors that's reached out to us because I was giving community lectures on what I was finding. Uh, they said, let's work together and let's bring this to hospital systems. And that began a two, three year uh, journey with them, um, but really I created a, a CME program for um, hospital Grand Rounds departments across the country um, to try to educate them on the effects of these chemicals that we now know called endocrine disrupting chemicals and what they do and break it down into classes for, for large university hospitals. It was remarkable. So let's just unpack that term, endocrine disrupting. I mean, we understand that there, there, there's a lot of attention uh, in terms of estrogen mim uh, mimetics, estrogen receptor, uh, things that will work both antagonistically and uh, 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 agonistically with respect to various receptors. But let's, uh, let's unpack what you're talking about when you're talking about endocrine disruptors. So endocrine disruptors has been coined as the, the overarching name for chemicals, um, and there are a variety of them, that have this uncanny and kind of worrisome ability to um, disrupt, and disrupt is a broad term because it can mean, as you mentioned, it can mimic uh, can, uh, hormones, which are basically chemical messengers in the human body. It can block them, and it can also work on the receptors, which is where these chemicals um, are delivering their message at the end organ or end tissue. And so there's lots of different ways that it turns out these chemicals can in fact disrupt the normal workings, the normal physiology of the human body, but we're talking very, very, very low doses, the way hormones work. Because over evolution, you know, through millions of years of evolution, we've conserved energy as human beings, and we have hormones that message very important physiology um, through very small amounts. Um, and that's exactly what these chemicals have the capability, and different chemicals have different capability, but the evidence is robust, it's international. Um, the World Health Organization has um, a four inch thick paper um, uh, basically describing this global um, onslaught of chemicals and how it's affecting endocrine disruption. Um, and of course, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the Endocrine Society, um, the American College of Reproductive Medicine all have their position statements. Um, so this is a real topic that has gained a lot of traction, especially over the last five years, uh, for five to 10 years. Well, certainly in the spotlight has been bisphenol A, which uh, has gained widespread use in terms of lining, a lining material for food products, uh, of all things, acting as an endocrine disruptor developed way back in 1936, and yet uh, the United States was the last, I think, uh, of the uh, developed countries to ban bisphenol A. So there's a lot of lobbying and politics that seems to be involved here. Well, actually, bisphenol A, interestingly enough, my co-author, um, Dr. Frederick Bomsall, um, for two books, the textbook that we wrote um, uh, in 2017 called Integrative Environmental Medicine and also now this consumer book that we partnered with, uh, partnered on. Um, he's really, and I will give him, you know, a shout out because this is an unsung hero. This is a, a, a clinician, I, I'm sorry, a researcher who um, was largely responsible from his research and his colleagues' research of removing bisphenol A, which you're, re you're talking about, from baby bottles in 2012. Now, if it was harmful enough and the data was robust enough to remove it, which is a very difficult thing to do in the United States in, in manufacturing. We've only had five chemicals in total 
removed from the U.S. market since 1976. I, I want to hold you right there. We need to just uh, state that again, that of the 90,000 that have been introduced in the past century, how many have been banned? Five. I, I, I don't want to say it again, but that is, it's quite a ratio, isn't it? It's remarkable. I mean, Europe um, does a much more rigorous job of vetting their chemicals before they go into products that we all use. Um, but the United States favors manufacturing, favors free market system, proprietary combinations for fragrance mm. and perfume. But BPA, you know, was one of the, uh, you know, along with lead is maybe the public health um, triumphs. We've only had a few, but lead being taken out of our society through gasoline and paint, uh, for instance, was a huge, um, you know, public health, um, you know, triumph. BPA was taken out of just baby bottles, plastic baby bottles, and it was not taken out of literally thousands of other products, including, as you said, canned foods and drinks, all of them, even organic foods and can and organic drinks. It's in the lining of the pla of the uh, metal cans to protect the food or drink from the outside container. That's um, a great word to protect the food while it's yes. being exposed to this yes. powerful endocrine disruptive chemical. But let's continue. <laughs> yeah. So BPA has this. It was one of the first um, formal endocrine disruptors to be identified. It was identified almost haphazardly in one of the studies that was used to looking for other things. And then it turns out the contamination was coming from the plastic mouse water feeder. So that's an interesting story in and of itself, how it skewed the data. And they said, well, what, what's changing the data and making more estrogen in the feed or changing the, and it was turned out to be the plastic feeder for the fish, for the uh, uh, right. mice. Um, but what happened was this BPA was originally, you know, as you mentioned, discovered in 1936, um, and it was found to be an endocrine disruptor back then. It was going to be used for, um, you know, for medications, believe it or not. Um, but it was then also found to create this epoxy resin when, when the molecules were put together, it came, it became a kind of a hard substance that was clear. So it could be used for, you know, bare aspirin bottles and a variety of clear plastics. And so it kind of veered towards that production. It is now one of the most um, high, it's the highest production volume industrial chemical essentially worldwide. Um, and it's somewhere in the range of 40 billion pounds per year are produced. And it's in a variety of products, not just canned foods, but it also sets ink on, um, on tickets like airplane tickets, parking tickets, most receipts. Um, and so it is on the surface. And so, you know, to your point, how do you, you know, or I guess towards the end of this discussion, we'll talk about some really practical, practical, um, activities to reduce exposures because you can get dermal skin exposure of BPA through receipts is really don't take your receipt if you can avoid it, fold the receipts um, because the, the top printing and ink, um, put it in an envelope, um, wash your hands. And if you work in an industry that handles quite a bit of receipts, you want to make sure you either, you know, put band-aids on your fingertips um, or wash your hands regularly. So, you know, some may say, oh, that's silly. Uh, where, where's the evidence? And I, I think in the context uh, of that statement or, or question, we have to understand that in America, things are okay until they're found to be threatening. As, and we would think, oh my gosh, everything is tested before it's unleashed upon the public, but uh, that's wishful thinking. That is, you know, what goes on in, in other countries. But in America, uh, it's uh, innocent until proven guilty, right? So there's no vetting process when new chemicals are unleashed upon the public until such time as there's an outcry or evidence that there's, there's, a, there's harm and a threat. Yeah, and what's interesting is if you look at, you know, the first chapter of, of our book was really, you know, in fact, Dr. Vom Saul's, um, uh, you know, all of, a lot of his work, work fighting on Capitol Hill and working through the legislative process with his data. But essentially, we've had multiple opportunities in U.S. history regulation to really start to put an end to this exposure of chemicals and at least require them to be tested before they go into all of our products that we enjoy. In 1938, 1958, 1976 was TSCA, um, the Toxic Substance Control Act. And then it was reversed even in 2016 to make it even harder 
um, to really test these chemicals. So we we essentially grandfathered in over 82,000 chemicals um, in 1976, and 2016, we really don't require any to be tested either. So it is up to the consumer, it's up to the patient, it's up to us as family members to really empower ourselves with good information to reduce those exposures. You know, not that this is the end of our time together, but I think probably the most important take home message would be that there's nobody really looking out for you in terms of what you're exposed to, that this is something you have to do for yourself. That if you're expecting there to be governmental oversight in terms of what is safe and what is threatening, it's just not there. I mean, I, I'm not trying to be you know, too aggressive here, but the, the reality is that there is virtually no oversight in terms of this multitude of chemicals that are perfectly legitimate and legal in terms of being used in manufacturing and to which we are exposed every single day. Absolutely, and to your point where you were discussing whether or not things could be taken off the market, not only, for instance, is BPA, you know, was that taken out in baby bottles, it was replaced by BPS, BPSIP, BPFB. There's a variety of bisphenol compounds that are incredibly similar and in fact may actually, as we're seeing now from the data, cause more endocrine disruption issues. And so what they do is they can take out something like a BPA because they're required to, but then they can actually add in all of these regrettable substitutions, which is what they're called, because it's whack-a-mole. We're chasing whack-a-mole, after yes. these product, these chemicals after they're unleashed into the public. And believe it or not, if there's a product that has a problem, you know, we've heard about shampoos that make hair fall out. That was a big story. It is only required by, it is, it is not required by the U.S. government to um, remove them from the shelves or from the market. It's actually up to the manufacturers to do it voluntarily. Caveat Which is absurd. Indoor. Yeah. So uh, it even lines intravenous tubing, that plastic tubing that we use when we start an IV and run it into somebody. That's got bisphenol in it, doesn't it? Well, there's products, there's actually companies that have removed DEHP, which are phthalates and BPA. Um, and there's some wonderful studies we talk about in, 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 this, um, in this book where, um, you know, when they removed those, those lines into, for instance, a NICU or a pediatric unit or some place of intensive care where they're using lots of respiratory equipment, lots of lines for feeding and for blood um, and for fluids, um, that there are companies that are now consciously removing those chemicals. The problem is, and what I discovered when I was lecturing to all these um, departments, uh, medical departments across the country, is that it's up to the hospital system to go after those other companies to replace those chemicals, uh, I'm sorry, those products with safer products. And um, Healthcare Without Harm is a wonderful organization that helps to do that. It's a nonprofit. Um, but really, we're talking about another bottleneck between options and the doers. And that is, that's really what's, what's so upsetting to me is we have lots of opportunities to do better. Uh, and I'm not seeing a lot of that happening at the administrative level of many um, institutions. Well, we still have to stay at the plate and wait for the perfect pitch. I, I would suspect that it may not be cost effective for a hospital or, or other a medical institution to replace their IV tubing and their IV bags for that matter, if in fact these products that you're talking about are that uh, hard to come by. Yeah, I mean, I think everything that requires change is a headache. Um, you know, changing the formulations of many cosmetics and personal care products in the U.S. has been a real headache for Johnson & Johnson and Revlon. And what they end up doing, some of these companies, I can't speak to those specifically because things change over time, is that Revlon, for, for instance, at one point was making the same product with a different formulation for Europe and for the European market than they were for the U.S. market. And um, same with flame retardant chemicals. Um, we, in 1975, we had to start allowing, or I should say the manufacturers were putting in flame retardant chemicals um, into fabrics and cushions and couches essentially, um, you know, to really increase this burn time, the, reduce the burn time, I should say increase the burn time of smoldering before a fire um, would happen in a couch. Say if someone dropped a, a cigarette on a couch, it would allow about 12 seconds for those inhabitants to get out of the home. Well, we now know that those flame retardant chemicals are endocrine disruptors, many of them, um, and that they were pervasive in all of the furniture that started to roll out throughout the country, even though that law really went into effect in California. 
And so now manufacturers don't want to necessarily replace that issue by taking those chemicals out. They don't want to remedy now that the law has been overturned in California. They don't want to go and do the work. So, you know, things follow, but they do it slowly and often um, voluntarily, or I would say if it's fiscally feasible um, by manufacturing. We're talking about um, mostly here endocrine disruption, but let's see if we can uh, move into immune function, especially as it might relate to how these exposures may influence a person's uh, contracting or expression of COVID? Great question. So um, when COVID came out, uh, when we really started to understand what we were in, um, Fred Von Sahl and I got together and we really started to think about how these chemicals um, really played a big role in COVID-19 uh, in terms of the death and morbidity, mortality from COVID-19. Um, because not everyone exposed to COVID gets ill, gets sick, ends up on a vent, ends up dead. Um, and so there's this kind of, um, uh, you know, uh, exposure related question. Well, it turns out that because many of these chemicals that we are kind of bathed in through food, through air quality and our air fresheners and our candles and our, um, you know, cosmetics, um, food chemicals, water, drinking water chemicals, flame retardants, I can go on and on and on, they actually increase inflammatory markers. This has been well studied. Um, that besides being a hormone or endocrine disruption um, process, many of these chemicals in fact raise circulating cytokines, um, a variety of components of the human immune system that um, express inflammation. And the reason this is a problem when it comes to COVID-19 or, or primarily any future infection or any infection we're, we're likely to experience in the future, this is not the end of it, um, is that we have a baseline inflammatory setting. And when you have this insult from the outside coming at you, such an infection, um, it raises, the, you, you've already raised the baseline level, so the inflammatory expression is pretty strong. And also, secondarily, um, you have all these chronic conditions that are associated with endocrine disruption. So diabetes, obesity, heart disease, pulmonary disease, autoimmune disease. And so those are implicated, those chemicals are implicated in those chronic health conditions. So you can see that this is almost like a cascade or a crescendo of inflammation when in fact the body sees an inflammatory insult. I had an interesting experience a couple of years ago. I was preparing to uh, slides to give a lecture on Parkinson's. And in one of the experiments that I was talking about, the researchers used a particular chemical uh, to induce Parkinson's in baboons. As soon as they gave them this chemical, they would get Parkinson's. So I wanted to uh, learn uh, a little bit more about uh, this chemical. So I Googled it, and the first thing that popped up was an ad for it on Amazon. And it was a, a uh, it was a type of stuff that you put on your vegetable garden to yep. kill insects. That was the same drug that was being used in the experimental laboratory to create Parkinson's. And now that it, it was marketed as something to put on the food that you eat, I thought that was kind of a, interesting. Uh, you know, uh, man is the only animal who will befoul his own nest. A sure sign of madness. Um, let's. Uh, transition to one other uh, important uh, toxic exposure that we have, and that's perchlorate. Mm -hmm. And let's talk about that in relation to thyroid. Yeah, this is fascinating. Um, and a lot of this work and outcry comes even from a colleague, um, Maricel Mafini, who works with um, food additives, and she did a wonderful chapter in our textbook. Um, you know, perchlorate is an allowable food wash. Let's start with that. The U.S. allows many, many chemicals in the food processing um, you know, system. So it's not just food chemicals that I want people to be aware of, especially when they read the food chapter in this book. I want people to understand that there's a history of that food before it even gets to your shelf or even gets to your plate. And that includes, you know, where it was picked, what was the soil quality, were there fertilizers and um, obviously pesticides added, how was that pulled off of the land and put into packages? Because there's many chemicals that are also added in terms of freshness and preservatives and emulsifiers to make things look smoother, um, you know, such as dairy products. Um, and then, you know, putting it into packaging, 
Again, that's another exposure that can get into the food that will eventually get into us. Um, perchlorate um, as a food wash for produce um, has a strong affinity for components of the human thyroid gland. It likes to get into the human thyroid gland, which in and of itself is a very vulnerable endocrine order, uh, uh, organ. So it wants to get in there and it can get in there through what's called the sodium iodine um, simp order. Um, so it can just make its way in. Well, you know, what's interesting about these environmental chemicals like perchlorate, cyothionate, and um, nitrate, which is a fertilizer chemical, those all like to get into the thyroid. Now, what's protective of the thyroid, which is why I love to talk about how nutrition, and you're a big component, you know, a, a, a proponent of nutrition, of course. I'm is glad how I'm not a component of nutrition. <laughs> that would not be a good thing. <laughs> no, you're not a, no, you're a proponent. Um, is that nutrition is in remarkably, you know, if it's done well and it's compatible with human evolution and what our bodies are used to, such as iodine, which is part of our, our diet for millions of years from fish, from cranberries and different small fruits, from nuts, um, from navy beans, Iodine loves to sit in the thyroid. It's supposed to sit in the thyroid. It protects the thyroid in the same little spots that perchlorate, cyanide, cyothionate, and nitrate like to get into. So it's a very simple fix in many ways is that if we can get our nutrition really up to snuff, we are doing ourselves a big favor in prevention of environmental exposure problems, uh, thyroid disease, hypo, hyper, and autoimmune thyroid conditions like Hashimoto's. Well, I mean, it, you have to consider that in our hundreds of thousands of years of evolution, our physiology worked really well uh, in response to the environmental challenges that it experienced. Suddenly, in the blink of an eye, we're challenging our bodies with things for which it is absolutely ill-equipped. Uh, it is not equipped. So when, when various chemicals compete uh, into pathways that are already established for, for bringing various chemicals in, you know, how do we deal with that? And I think, um, you know, one of the detoxification uh, issues that you talk about quite extensively in the book is uh, obviously liver hepatic detoxification uh, phase one and phase two. And you're, you talk about how we can actually enhance that ability by making certain food choices. So maybe you can walk us through that. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm a big lover of anthropology. I studied it in college. I, it's been part of my whole medical training in my mind and all the courses I try to take from extracurricular, of course. They're not part of medical school training, unfortunately. Um, and I think that we need to step back as humans and have a perspective on what we're doing to ourselves. I mean, I get really pissed because I'm seeing so many young younger people sicker. And I think to myself, we have to step back about these modern day chemicals that have only been in our lives over the last 200 years at best, I would argue maybe 150. Um, and yet we've evolved millions of years to manage nutrition properly and to detox the body through just very helpful, normal physiology like exercise and sweating. We have this wonderful sweat process. We have a lymphatic system that helps remove many chemicals from our body uh, and pushes towards waste. Um, we have kidneys, we have liver um, you know, function. And so what I wanted to do, really, I was very curious um, to understand how what we can do proactively in terms of what we eat can help our body do what it's yearning to do, which is to clean up and heal itself and so I really wanted to emphasize how sweating, whether it's through exercise or with my patients who can't necessarily move that quickly, um, you know, because of their arthritis of sorts, they, they can go into a sauna, conventional sauna, raise their temperature, assuming their heart can handle it and they've been okayed from that perspective. Um, but also the quality of drinking water, which is a big beef that I also have about um, our water system. Uh, I dedicate a whole chapter with Fred to drinking water because it is just such an important issue that's underrated in, in most people's lives. But we can utilize certain vegetables, cruciferous vegetables, for instance, have an enormous amount of detoxability um, through chemicals like Indo-3-carbonyl and sulforaphane. 
glucosinolates. Um, you know, these are the kinds of, you know, chemicals, compounds that churn up the good, healthy detox processes of the liver. And we can all wrap our heads around a great bowl of, um, you know, grilled asparagus. Well, asparagus is, I'm not sure, a cruciferous vegetable, but broccoli, uh, you know, Brussels sprouts, bok choy. I mean, I have a whole list. I don't cook Kale, very cabbage. much. Yeah, I mean, it's funny because I have wonderful lists of food I don't even know if I've ever cooked with, but I did look them up and make sure they were all cruciferous vegetables. And sure enough, um, uh, they're wonderful and filled with great nutrient value. Yeah, I mean, I think of of what you've mentioned, sulforaphane is really getting a lot of attention. It turns out that um, while the precursors uh, are of available, various precursors uh, to create these helpful chemicals in in a lot of the cruciferous vegetables, looks like broccoli is really the one uh, where we get the precursor from which we then uh, the glucoraphanin from which we then under the influence of a specific enzyme myrosinase are able then to produce specifically sulforaphane, which, uh, as you mentioned, is a key player in detoxification, amplifying uh, all as a lot of the aspects of detoxification through uh, activation of a pathway, the NRF2 pathway, et cetera. But uh, I think that you know if a person's really wanting to amp up their uh, detox uh, protocol, you mentioned sauna. And uh, again, sulforaphane, I would say broccoli sprouts would be a real, uh, really high on the list of the things that I would recommend. Chewing them, releasing that enzyme, activating the glucoraphanin, creating this sulforaphane. Interesting that we now r recognize that even eating broccoli allows you to make sulforaphane because we have bacteria in the gut that actually do contain and manufacture the myrosinase enzyme to then go ahead and allow us to even create sulforaphane in the gut. So yet another plug for keeping your gut bacteria healthy and happy. Let me get to the, um, the sauna, uh, I mentioned the sauna because uh, it's good to sweat, obviously. It's, it's a great way to get rid of stuff. And yet we are convinced that we need to be applying uh, antiperspirants to our underarms day in and day out. You specifically call that out in your book as generally being something to avoid. Yeah. And, you know, in fact, you know, the literature is is in terms of, for instance, breast cancer risk and many of the chemicals that we put directly under our armpits. Um, you know, I, I the, the literature is not as strong as I would like to say, you know, in terms of there's no such thing as really a cause and effect in environmental health because there's so many confounding issues. Is it lifestyle? Is it diet? Is it lack of exercise? Is it processed food? So can't all be to blame in terms of breast cancer um, risk in terms of deodorant. But deodorant and antiperspirants are very different. And I wanted to call that out because antiperspirants are often, and most of the products in the market, are made with a very teeny tiny molecules of aluminum. And they, what they do is they actually, when you put them on your armpits, they actually get absorbed into the sweat glands and that's where the sweat stays. So it's an osmotic effect where water follows solute or water follows aluminum, so to speak. And it would stay on the inside of your skin, just under the surface level. And that's what keep people, keeps people dry, which is often what people want. But what that also raises the question of, is that aluminum, which is so readily transferable throughout the body, is that a risk for breast cancer um, and other maybe neurodegenerative disease and, and other types of um, chronic illnesses? Um, and is it something that we can quickly switch out? And that is really, again, the basis of the book is we can make simple swaps based on what's called the precautionary principle. And even if the data isn't overwhelming, but it's suggestive, we can make simple swaps because it just makes good sound sense to put a different type of topical deodorant, not antiperspirant, which is against sweating, but deodorant really is more about letting yourself be a little, it's maybe a little bit more wet or moist under your armpits, but certainly far fewer chemicals that could potentially cause harm in your body. And I, I encourage people to switch to deodorant, um, especially women. Um, there's a lot in, in the book about breast cancer risk and breast cancer um, findings in terms of cosmetics and personal care products, but it's a simple swap and there's easy ways to look the safer brands up um, as we give in the book. Um, and, and really it's just, again, a precautionary principle means it just makes sense to make those swaps if it doesn't cost any more money or any more energy. Um, that's, that's the goal of this book. 
you, you bring up a very good point, and that is your book serves as a terrific resource. You know, people are scratching their heads, okay, what should I use instead of blank? You know, and the type of uh, utensils in the, in the kitchen, the how I get my food, uh, deodorants versus antiperspirants, et cetera. And you are really uh, heavy on the resources, giving people the tools then to make these changes. Um, you have a section dedicated to travel, which I was very happy to see, although <laughs> a lot of us aren't doing a lot of that right now. But that said, uh, for, for many of us who are really trying to be circumspect in terms of our lifestyle choices, travel presents challenges because of uh, food and environment. So maybe a brief overview on some tips for traveling. Yeah, you know, what I kind of did when I was going through writing and setting up the, um, the outline for this book, this was really a book nine years in the making. And it became, it was really a journey from the first time I heard that chemicals were not tested before they go into the products I put on my skin or my kid's skin or my pet food, um, all the way to where I feel like I'm starting to get a handle on, on really how to go about this big picture problem. Um, you know, and so I wanted to kind of write the book as if it was given to me nine years ago when I needed it. Um, assuming that people that are picking up this book really have no idea that there even is a problem. Um, and that there is any health risks to what we use day to day. Um, and so one of the aspects, you know, was just walking through life now with sort of, um, you know, chemical uh, precautionary glasses where everything I do now almost sparks, a, you know, an interest, a concern. Uh, well, what about that soccer turf may be a problem for my children because they're on it three times a week with practice and on tournaments on weekends. So I wrote a section about soccer turf, not just about chemicals, which may, you know, which are often on there, synthetic, but how it affects young people's knees in terms of their ACL tears potentially and, and, and what, what orthopedic, pediatric orthopedic doctors are saying and writing about in terms of risk to knee injuries. Um, I, I'm a drinker of beer. I like alcohol, not so much wine, but I like a good beer. And I wanted to incorporate the things that interest me into the book. Um, and how to choose a better, healthier, maybe safer, less toxic alcohol drink if you want to. Um, and when it comes to travel, of course, we're not traveling as much, but we're going to probably get back into it, hopefully safely. Um, that, you know, there's a lot of ironies about our travel that are interesting to me. Um, drinking water on airplanes was a really interesting thing to discover in terms of the poor, if not absent, regulatory oversight of drinking water you receive when you go on an airplane. Um, and so that the studies that we talked about were pretty recent and they tested water in different air um, airline companies um, and discussed how um, the water in the bathrooms, how dirty they can be and how they're not um, really changed out and they just load up chlorine in there once a month more or less and um, how when you fly you should really consider you know the bottled water if you are not taking your own because the water in the coffee and the tea that's served is often the water that was used in the bathroom water so you know it's um i i urge people to read you know the section in more detail because i don't think i'm doing it justice right now but the idea no i mean it, you're bringing up some very very important points and uh, i think that we just have to double down on our efforts to be that strange individual who carries his food along and uh water along when it's allowed and it, it you know it we only we only go around once, I, I believe, and you gotta do the best you can. Um, I think that uh, you mentioned something about your kids on the soccer field, and from my perspective, I think among the highest rates of ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease uh, are seen in in professional soccer players in Europe, and also golf golfers and golf caddies. So one wonders what is being sprayed on the soccer field, what is being sprayed on the greens, etc. Uh, that may be associated with that, and breast cancer as well, for that matter. I mean, women professional golfers have an exceedingly uh, high risk rate for breast cancer, so uh, something definitely to think about. Well, let me let me say thank you uh, for being with us today, and thank you for putting this book together, uh, as well as you know working with Dr. Uh, Von Sal. You were uh, actually, I think, gifted by having the opportunity to have him as your co-author. That's for sure. Yeah, I, I am very clear on that. This was a, a kismet of a lot of different um, fateful events in my life that brought me to this moment. And working with Dr. Vom Saul, who happens to be really um, 
you know, a world renowned researcher and biologist and reproductive biologist. I mean, he's just remarkable. And so um, being that we're from different generations, he has grandchildren, I have young children. Um, he's from the research world and the regulatory world fighting those battles that no one hears about. And I'm a clinician on the front lines managing the downstream, you know, effects of many of these exposures. Um, it was just a really nice kismet to put our worlds together and and give the public something that I think you know is a gift to to our health. That's really what it is. It's prevention. It's a gift to um, you know really trying to reduce all the illness that we're seeing. Um, and um, and and I was an honor to be working with him. You know, there's a great metaphor that you just hinted at, and that is the downstream effects. I mean, it's like standing on the bank of of a river and seeing bad things come by, dead fish, whatever it is. Yeah. And you can either just work to keep the river clean now by scooping out the dead fish and piling them up on the shore, uh, which is sort of what mainstream medicine is all about. Or you can say, hang on a minute and begin your hike upstream a little bit and try to figure out what is going on. I mean, that's, uh, that's a, a very unusual tact for a, a clinician, for a medical doctor. You know, most of the time, uh, we spend uh, treating the smoke and not the fire. So uh, really kudos to you for deciding to literally go upstream and, you know, in the uh, spirit of Rachel Carson to uh, to go upstream and see where this is all having its origin. Yeah, I, I think it came out of frustration. Um, it came out of uh, professionally feeling frustrated with the system. Um, and, um, you know, I, I think that in many ways I'm blessed because I don't work in a hospital system. I don't work for anybody. And I think that's given me a voice uh, and a freedom to speak the truth about what we're really um, in, in now um, and, and what to do about it. And I feel for people who um, are feeling like their voices and their complaints are falling on deaf ears. I try to get physicians to think, um, you know, even though they have very limited time, 15 minute appointments, 30 minute appointments, to really consider adding a couple key questions to their um, examination with patients, which is just environmental health issues. Um, you know, where do your patients get their water from? Yeah, um, that's a you key know, question. It's just a key question or how much of their diet is processed and, you know, can you make a recommendation for frozen organics versus perhaps even fresh because it's cheaper and readily available at big box stores nationally. There are so many cost effective um, hacks that are not limited socioeconomically um, or from a knowledge base. And that's really, we were, we were aiming for fourth grade education and below, eighth grade education and below. Um, to really get this into um, disproportionately air, you know, areas where there is no access to um, uh, organic fruits and vegetables. So, you know, it was, um, it was an undertaking, but I think that we all need to kind of, you know, wake up or else we're going to be dealing with these issues and copays and medications and side effects from medications downstream. Um, let's, let's put a, an end to this in, at our own pace um, and really try to make these changes that stick. Well, before we say goodbye, I want to read something that was one of your chapter headings that I am going to probably uh, co-opt co and use myself somewhere. And it comes from The Lorax by Dr. Seuss. Unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better. It's not. So uh, that that's perfect. I mean, that absolutely encapsulates your, your book. We've got to do something right now if we want to help others and if we ourselves want to stay healthy. Yeah, and and I, you know, the headings really had meaning to me, all the quotes that came from different places. My I started the book with the um with the serenity prayer, which many in your audience may know, um which of course I forget every time, but I will try to read it because I have it in front of me. But serenity prayer reads, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference. And I felt that that was pretty critical, especially when I was on the ledge freaking out about all of these things maybe five years ago. I've since come down off the ledge to get a better perspective on what we really can use our time, our money, our energy effectively to change versus worrying too much about that which we can't and wasting all of that precious energy that could go into increasing our, our health, improving our health. For many years, I kept that prayer in my wallet and I would read it when I was confronted uh, with a challenging situation in the intensive care unit, knowing mm -hmm. that, you know, I may not be able to pull this one out. Uh, and 
I would read that and you know recognize that we're never going to be in a hundred percent, but we got to keep we got to keep trying. So uh, again, back to the the Lorax. What a great quote that is too from Dr. Seuss. Well, listen, thank you so much for spending time with us today. Wonderful, wonderful book. Uh, most importantly, I think it does two things. It calls it out, but it's actionable. It's telling us, okay, this is the situation, but rather than just point the finger, here are our options for getting involved and also for changing our lifestyles for, for you know, really reducing risk. Yeah, I, I appreciate it. Not only did I appreciate you um, reading and understanding and giving it a, a beautiful testimonial, because I think this is way in line with what you do as well, Dr. Perlmutter. But, um, you know, I also want people to know that if the book is not, you know, they're not ready to jump, jump in. I hope they are because it's very simple. I also post um, environmental health tips. Um, information, recommendations, very simply on um, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, uh, called The Smart Human. Again, back to that anthropology part of me that that adores that, um, that we are all humans and we can all be smart humans. So it's called The Smart Human. And um, I, I hope people will pass it on to their teenagers and their um, their moms and dads, because it's really just, uh, I hope, entertaining and interesting for them to get nuggets of great health information. Well, with any luck at all, with modern technology, that should be appearing on the bottom third of our screen right about now. So uh, that's where people should go uh, to learn more information. So thanks for spending time with us today. I hope we get to see each other at some point soon. Who knows? I hope so, too. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. My pleasure. Bye for now. That was really important information. I mean, uh, who knew... Uh, the, the scale of what uh, our world is really like in terms of exposing us to these toxicants. And beyond that, not only how they work disruptively, but I think the most important uh, take-home message that uh, Dr. Cohen gives to us today is that there's hope and we can choose a, uh, to choose a less toxic uh, life, a life of less toxic exposure. Thanks for joining me today. I'm Dr. David Perlmutter, and we will be back soon. Bye for now. Thank you.